Hi, folks. Welcome. Welcome back. Um, okay, great. Folks, thank you so, so much for taking the time to be with, uh, here with us tonight. We are so excited uh, to have John Hoagley here with us, uh, running in uh, uh, Michigan's uh, sixth congressional district. Um, but we have a little bit of a fun update before that. So before we dive in, um, we're going to hear from our co-founder, Adam Green. I think we're all uh, excited to hear a little bit more about last night's victories uh, in New York and how all things are looking in Kentucky. Um, and then we actually uh, have a surprise guest. We have, um, we have folks from Andrew Romanoff's campaign here with us that are gonna share a quick update uh, ahead of his primary uh, next week as, as well. So let me go ahead and uh, kick it over to our co-founder, Adam Green. Adam? All right, it, it, it was a surprise guest. <laughs> <laughs> surprise gone, sorry about that folks. Just kidding. Um, so, huge night, you know, I, I'll say a quick story. In 2012, um, after the election results came in in November, uh, Stephanie and I were in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia with our entire staff and we pulled our whole team together and we said, you know, look around this circle of people, remember this night, this might be the best election of your life. It was the night that Elizabeth Warren came to the Senate, Tammy Baldwin, um, Mark Pocan, Congressional Progressive Caucus leader, a ton of other people got swept in that year and just everything went right. Well, I think last night was the primary version of that. I think we went about five for five last night. And if we were gonna rename these calls, not meet the candidates, we might call it, you heard it here first. Because just a couple weeks ago, many folks on this call heard about this guy named Mondaire Jones in New York 17th district. And he is now quickly becoming a, a national icon. Uh, one of two, um, you know, first, black gay men who will be serving in Congress openly. Uh, the other is Richie Torres, who we also helped get out the vote for. Uh, we, the, the banner headline for the night was Jabal Bowman's win. Uh, he was behind by double digits just a couple weeks ago, and he seems to uh, have won by double digits last night. The votes are still being counted, but he's declared victory, and pretty much all the prognosticators say that he is the big winner that is already sending shockwaves through the political system. Um, we had Dana Balter, who you heard from, uh, on one of these calls in upstate New York, a very hard, pro hard fought primary last cycle that we won with her as the nominee. Uh, she came just a couple points shy of, of flipping a red district blue and she won her primary and will finish the job this time around. And then in Kentucky, a race that very few people saw coming but quickly catapulted into the popular imagination uh, just in the last couple of weeks. We were proud to endorse Charles Booker recently, uh, quickly raised him about $23,000 um, and he, you know, fingers crossed, seems to be on the verge of victory. Uh, basically, things have been pretty neck and neck. Amy McGrath a little bit ahead, um, but the two main bastions of votes, Lexington and Louisville, are still about to come in, and some exit polls have him winning by as much as uh, four to one odds, or four to one there. So we're very optimistic that we could, we could have a clean sweep of about five for five. PCCC members donated about $115,000 for candidates who were on the ballot last night. Um, so I wanna say thank you to all those, all those of you on this call who have been so conscientious about investing in progressive races, wanting to get the most bang for your buck, invest in real rock stars. Last night, I think we really uh, achieved the goal of putting some new rising stars on the map. Also worth noting that uh, AOC also had a big re-election against a conservative uh, who was spending real money against her. So great night for progressives and with that as our springboard, we are thrilled today to endorse two new Senate candidates. Um, we've pretty much said that the three most important Senate races for progressives, uh, in addition to all the hard work that we will do to elect Democrats to the Senate, um, are Charles Booker, um, Andrew Romanoff in Colorado, and Ed Markey, who's in a competitive um, race unnecessarily in Massachusetts. Uh, so we have endorsed both Markey and Romanoff today. We'll be fundraising for them, we already are, as well as continuing the drive for folks like R.T. Kravik in New Jersey, who folks have heard from on, this, on one of these meetings, um, Mike Siegel and Candace uh, Valenzuela from, from Texas. So um, with that, we are thrilled to have former PCCCer Evan Barker, who is the finance director for Rom Andrew Romanoff's campaign, who will give us a quick 
briefing on the dynamics of that race that we're now six days away from. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great, great, great. We also have Tara on the call as well, who's Andrew's campaign chair. So I'll just give a quick finance update. Um, today has been one of our biggest fundraising days to date. Um, we just hit $1 million for the quarter, which is amazing, um, especially considering that 85% of our money has come from inside the state of Colorado. Um, with over 18,000 individual contributions um, made to Andrew throughout the state. So really, really fantastic news. And I'll just pass it over to uh, Tara real quick, who can talk a little bit more about polling and some of the other exciting developments um, around this race. Well, I bet, I'll, can you guys all hear me? Great. I bet you guys have been watching the national news. We have been trying to break through for some time. And once um, John Hickenlooper started doing public events with Andrew, Andrew just soared. Um, there are very different um, candidates and Andrew is phenomenal on the spot. Um, Hickenlooper has continued to put his foot in his mouth and say things that have really brought a lot of negative national attention. And in the meantime, uh, we had done polling in October and just did it a week ago. And Hickenlooper has dropped almost 50 points. It's phenomenal um, how much steam we've picked up. Um, we are really close um, in our polling and it's getting closer every day. Hickenlooper and is so worried actually that they started an independent expenditure against this pack and they spent a million dollars in attack ads against Andrew um, in the last eight days. But people are really coming out um, from the woodwork and supporting us, and it's been really phenomenal. The national press, we actually can't keep up with all the press coverage and the requests because um, Andrew's really on fire. And in the meantime, the press is just talking about how Hick is sinking so quickly. We have been up against the DSCC from day one, they threatened people who I tried to hire. I had a very hard time finding staff to work for us. People were about to sign um, you know, agreements um, and get on board, and then all of a sudden they would just go dark. Uh, so this is really a phenomenal tale of just a David versus Goliath and how hard we've worked to get here. And just wanna say, Adam, thank you and your organization for all of your support. It just continues to help us build momentum. And we're really excited because the election is on, is next Tuesday. Cool. Thank and you, thing, Stephanie, as well. I was just gonna say that. Um, one of the things that um, really motivates myself and my co-founder Stephanie around this race is just the light and day difference between Hickenlooper and Andrew Romanoff. And for all of us who care about taking back the Senate and what we will do with possibly a very fragile Senate majority, um, again, I, I see two races, one in the House and one in the Senate, as taking on J Joe Lieberman type figures. People who will not just be wishy-washy or bad, but who will actively undermine democratic leadership as they try to do stuff, right? Hickenlooper is running in a state that Jared Polis, our friend, ran uh, a race around Medi on Medicare for All uh, last cycle and won by double digits. And Hickenlooper is sit sitting there trash talking things like Medicare for All, Green New Deal, any kind of corporate responsibility. We, we don't need that in, <laughs> in a state that we can win with double digits on those issues. We need someone from states like that who will actually be fighting and leading the charge on our issues. So again, it's one of those things where, you know, we're deducting an active bad player and adding an active good player, not just tampering with the middle. So, so thrilled and thankful for everything that Evan and Tara, you're doing, the whole team. Um, thank you for joining us on this call and we're thrilled to be in with you for the next six days. Full speed ahead. Thank you so much. And, you know, really quick, Adam, I just want to mention that Hicks so worried that he's starting to run new ads. It talks about how progressive he is. He's talking about how he's fighting for health care for everybody, and he really supports clean energy. And so you're right. Their, their polling must show that he's in trouble on those issues. Thank you, guys. All right, back to you, Rachel. Well, we are rooting for you. Um, we will be uh, doing what we can from afar and watching this closely and um, are very, very excited. We think there's a real potential for an upset 
here next Tuesday. So keep going. I think you've got the wind at your back. Um, so thank you, thank you again for, for joining us and giving us a very quick, exciting update on a race that, as we said, is really starting to break through right now, um, which is really exciting to see. Um, and with that said, I want to turn to uh, our other special guest tonight. Um, and the call tonight is to meet John Hoadley, um, who I believe is here now. Um, Hi, Steve. <laughs> hey, so, um, so, so thank you to everybody for joining our call tonight. And thank you also to our partners, Equality Path and Victory Fund. Um, they will be talking with John Hoadley, who is running for Congress in Michigan 6. And he's running to unseat one of the worst enemies of the environment that is in Congress, and that is Congressman Fred Upton. Um, this is an opportunity to see from red to blue, but it's also a real opportunity for the planet. Uh, Upton is chair of the Energy Committee. He's taken over $2 million in oil and gas contributions. Um, to big oil, you know, he consistently takes millions of dollars in campaign contributions and then votes with corporate interests. Many of us, for context, have been trying for many, many years to beat Fred Upton. And what's exciting is it feels like John is the best opportunity we've ever had. He's leading Upton in polling. He's raised over a million dollars, which I believe is a record for anyone running to take on Fred Upton. He's racked up endorsements from the Michigan Congressional co Delegation, from local unions, from major progressive groups, obviously from our co-hosts, the Equality PAC and Victory Fund. And he's running as a bold progressive. He's running on a platform that includes Medicare for All, the Green New Deal, expanding Social Security. So this is a very exciting race. I'm so glad we get to introduce you to him tonight. And so with that, and no further ado, let me please introduce uh, the man who will finally beat Fred Upton, John. Oh, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I really appreciate y'all jumping on. Um, I feel, uh, I wish we had a little bit of time, uh, and I'm sorry for being late. My colleague, uh, Sarah Anthony, who was also going to join us on this call, and I literally just came off the floor um, because there is a uh, nearly 40 bills that are moving today on uh, through the state legislature and some of them are um, exactly what we were just talking about resolutions that are meant to divide the coalitions of labor and folks advocating for the environment uh, resolutions that potentially would uh, weaken our healthcare system we know that there's a lot of other good bills too um, but we're finding one of these sort of power hour days um, and so thank you for being flexible you know, I always keep telling people, I am so excited to run for Congress so we can put people and community at the center of our decisions. But I've got a day job to do too. I was elected as a state representative and I take that, that responsibility very seriously. So as a state representative, I've been working hard to make sure that we're fighting for uh, healthcare and the environment. As one of the uh, out members of the state legislature, um, you know, it's we're up there trying to make sure that we are ending discrimination against LGBT folks. I'm introducing a bill yet today that will be trying to make sure that when we have emergency plans put in place, that LGBT folks can't be discriminated in medical decisions that are being made. Um, and, you know, I still watch how representation matters, especially in places like this where, um, you know, we can have resolutions move on ice cream, but we still can't move for the sixth year in a row. A, a, just a simple resolution to talk about pride and you know and what that means for our communities but you know we have a huge opportunity here i'm so proud of the team and the folks in the district who are working incredibly hard to make sure that our stories and the need for change are being heard you know i talk about my my partner chris a lot for folks that don't know he has multiple sclerosis and when I got that news, we got that news sitting in the emergency room together and just the uncertainty that the current healthcare system would mean when dealing with a, a disease and a condition like multiple sclerosis. Anyone that has taken care of a loved one knows that feeling of both uh, anxiety and angst as you're trying to figure out everything you can about something you knew very little about, but then all the, the headaches that come with it. You know, questions about 
uh, what bills that we can we pay or can we afford to pay uh, every January now asking you know will the drugs that are the prescription medications that are finally helping him uh, live his best life and he is living his best life be still covered by his employer-based health care coverage you know whether it's the lack of care unpredictable bills unaffordable prescription drugs the question of whether we're even going to have health care if we have a job all of these things are empowering me to fight for medicare that is actually going to that works for everybody right that we need something like medicare for all or a single pale health care system that actually addresses the needs of our communities and i'd say this too uh, being a state legislator i also know hey we need an all above the above approach so whether we're uh, supporting five dollar copay copays in the short term or uh, cracking down and holding our prescription drug companies accountable. Uh, let's do that. Oh, and by the way, as a state legislator, I've been doing work on long-term care, created a bipartisan care caucus. And so getting to um, see parts of long-term care covered in things like Medicare for All gets me so excited um, because everybody should be able to age with dignity in their homes. And if you want a door opener and a conversation starter in a slightly rural district like mine, talk about an incredible conversation to have. But just the last couple of things to flag, and I wouldn't want to open for questions. The opportunities in this district are huge. People are tired of, you know, big money Fred, who keeps taking money from corporate interests and then says the right things to the New York Times and votes the wrong way for people in our district. They are tired of an unauthentic voice who hems and haws about being a moderate, but still votes with Trump over 80 percent of the time. You know, when it comes to the big issues facing our communities, we need people that are gonna vote with us. Fred Upton has been in that seat for 34 years. I am 36 years old, and I'm part of a generation that is calling for, the, for solutions to the problems we face today. You know, he's had 10, 20, 34 years to set us up for success, and we see challenge after challenge uh, still facing our communities. So with the help of PCCC, uh, the Equality Caucus, the Victory Fund, and so many parts of so many organizations, we've built an incredible coalition that is ready to take on this challenge. We are ahead in the polls. We have an incredible team of volunteers and interns uh, and folks who are uh, dedicating their time, their talent, their treasure to helping us connect with voters. Uh, we have levels of voter contact that we have not seen ever in this district. Um, and with your help, we're going to be able to make sure that we get over the finish line. Of course, you know, I'm inspired by the big wins yesterday. And our, uh, you know, our primary is coming up on August 4th. And of course, uh, with the deadlines coming up at the end of the month, we wanna show that uh, progressives can win everywhere uh, and your help will get that done. So I, that's enough for me. I would love to answer folks' questions. John, thank you so, so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay, we have our first question. Um, from our friend, uh, Morris Pearl, head of the Patriotic Millionaires. Um, Morris, sir, what is your question for John? Hey, John, good to uh, talk to you again and uh, wishing you the best of luck. You mentioned Fred Upton's big money donors. Does that come up in your conversations with your voters? Are they concerned about that? Are you planning to promote things like the campaign finance reform in HR1? Is that something you talk about much? Absolutely. Um, thanks, Morris. Yeah. So, you know, Fred voted, the, really set this current Congress off on the wrong foot when he voted against the largest, largest ethics reform package since Watergate. And, you know, when it comes, when I talk to folks, people are hungry to see campaign finance reform and ethics reform. And they know that if you've taken millions of dollars over the years in, you know, a big oil money and big pharma money, you're never going to be able to tackle the the real challenges that we're facing. And let's not forget that, you know, in the middle of a health pandemic, uh, Fred Upton's campaign took over took twenty eight thousand dollars from the DeVos family on uh, one day. So you know he's not going to be fighting for public education when he's taking, uh, you know, that DeVos money, who has put a profiteering and privatization agenda that's hurt our children. So it comes up a lot. Um, I'm excited to support HR1. Uh, you know, uh, put that, let's, let's do it HR1 2.0 and let's do it at, right up uh, in January of next year. Thank you. Thank Good you, luck, Morris. Sir. Thank you, uh, John. All right, up next, you have a question from our friend, uh, Margie Roswell. 
Uh, Margie, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to mute yourself. And uh, Margie, what's your, what's your question for John? Oh, hi. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to be on the screen, but my question is, is simple just to share a bit about your district, you know, the demographics, what people do there, partisan nature. Those are some questions. Well, awesome. And Margie, great to see you. Um, so the district, the district, uh, the sixth congressional district encompasses about six counties in Southwest Michigan. It's, um, you know, overall, the demographics actually reflect um, the overall demographics of the state actually pretty well um, are in terms of racial demographics. Uh, we're about 82% white, 18% uh, people of color. And, uh, you know, we're slightly younger than the average part of the state with a pretty even gender split. Uh, the sixth congressional district though is made up of a set of pockets. So we have uh, dense urban cores in Kalamazoo and Portage, Benton Harbor and St. Joe has Fortune 500 companies, higher education institutions, larger populations of people of color. We also then have uh, sort of some more suburban areas right around uh, Portage and St. Joe and some of these places and some bedroom communities from Chicago in Southwest portions of the district. And then we have a whole lot of rural, you know, places that remind me of uh, South Dakota where I grew up, where people grow things largely, uh, small towns. And, um, you know, and that's sort of the St. Joe County, Cass County, Van Buren, and Allegan. What that means, though, is that uh, there are places where, um, you know, we're going to be having to run up the score with Democratic base voters and, and also doing the work to inspire independents and Republicans who no longer see themselves in the party as a, giving them a place to land, which a common sense agenda about long term care and the environment that you can, uh, you know, breathe the air and drink the water is really key to that. In terms of other things people do, like I said, we've got a couple of the state's larger and um, uh, prominent higher education institutions, Western Michigan University, Kalamazoo College. Uh, we're home to a few Fortune 500 companies that people may have heard of, Pfizer, Stryker, um, Whirlpool. Uh, and then, you know, if you've ever eaten like a Lay's potato chip, uh, anywhere east of the Mississippi, you're probably getting it from our area. Uh, we also have a ton of folks along the lake shore. And so that's, um, you know, sort of anywhere from Saugatuck Douglas for my, a lot of my LGBTQ friends uh, have maybe visited at some point in the summer, South Haven, uh, and then further along down the border. One last thing is uh, if anyone who enjoys RVing, a lot of them are actually manufactured right in my district. So we have some of the largest manufacturing and sales of RV equipment. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, uh, Margie, for that question. Um, all right, next we have a question from our friend, Scott Walker. Uh, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to mute yourself, please. Uh, oh, go ahead. And what is your question uh, for John, Scott? Hey, John. Love your energy and enthusiasm. Thanks. My question is, what can Congress do or what should Congress do to eliminate or modify uh, the doctrine of qualified immunity for police? Um, so you cut out for just a second, but I think you said, was, what's my position on modifying or ending qualified immunity for police? Yes. Great question. So uh, we've, had a long, we've had long conversations. You know, I've been working very closely um, on uh, police accountability uh, throughout my career. I was proud uh, to listen to advocates in my community when they said, we need to take risks right now and demand accountability and also larger racial justice reform. If you wanna see where I stand on a number of these issues, I really encourage you to visit johnhodley.com slash black lives matter. But you know, to answer your question directly, I support uh, ending or, or at least modifying uh, qualified immunity for police. It has placed us where folks who are charged to keep us safe uh, are and follow the laws are above the laws and that is not healthy. Um, for where we need to go. I would also know that, you know, I've talked to a lot of my friends in law enforcement and, um, you know, they're really welcoming this conversation right now because they want to be able to do the things, um, they don't have to be the same people that respond to, you know, a, um, a, 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 like an armed robbery as well as, you know, getting a cat out of the tree. Like we should be able to get folks uh, with the proper tools and training to intervene in those situations, which is why I called for in the same document uh, additional supports for 
uh, mental health professionals, uh, for social workers, modeling on some of these innovative programs we've seen in other parts of the country, where by prior prioritizing the investment in some of these really critical tools and assets, we get better results for everybody. Thank you. Great. Up next, we have a question from our friend Eric Lester. Uh, Eric, what is your question for John? Hey, John, we're big supporters of you. <laughs> it's great to see you tonight. Um, Fred Upton has been an utter failure when it comes to race relations in a, our community here, St. Joe Benton Harbor, which has had a deep history of trouble. Um, what leadership do you think you might be able to exert uh, in the sixth district at the local level uh, on the issues of race relations and the deeper issues of economic inequality? So I think it's important that um, you know leaders, their first job is to listen. So you should be listening to the communities that are most impacted by these issues. But when uh, communities and, and folks, in, particularly in communities of color, my African-American friends who are saying, we need you to take risks right now, I'm taking that very seriously. As a white ally, I need to make sure that I'm standing up and having my voter record reflect that. It is not enough to show up for a photo op if you're then gonna turn around the next day and try to run misleading ads on social media um, to scare people into silencing their voices on police accountability and reform. And just last week, there was um, you know, one of these sort of uh, just real stupid resolutions that was introduced. It just meant to divide people. And um, you know, I will note, while there's a number of, of really critical issues, they had to rush to the floor a vote that was opposed to the defunding and abolishing of police. And so I voted no, um, because one, we shouldn't be telling our locals what to do. Uh, two, uh, it was just the intentional mis silencing of this, fine, this account of conversation around racial justice and accountability and reform. And so, you know, right away when I see Fred Upton then try to go and slam these things all over social media. I mean, I say, shame on you. You know, you don't get to go in and, and be there for the photo op or, you know, say, yeah, let's march. But then your voting record reflects the wrong way. And that's the story in this district over and over. He says the thing people want to hear and votes the way that the big money and corporate interests tell him to vote. We deserve better. And so that's why um, you know, my commitment is to listen and elevate voices of communities of color, to take risks, to make sure that we're standing on the right side of justice, to continue as I have for years of investing and building up leadership within communities of color whenever possible. Um, and, you know, not always having all the right answers, but making the commitment to show up and listen. Bravo. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Eric, for the question. Thank you, John. Uh, up next, we have our friend Norbert uh, Hornstein. Mr. Hornstein, what's your question for John? Yeah, I'm, uh, I find all your policies delightful, and I hope you win. So here's my, a more practical question. What do you see as your biggest hurdle to a win in August? And after um, that, a win in the general? So great question. So. Uh, our polling knows that there, I still got to make increase my name ID, meaning a lot of folks in Kalamazoo know who I am, obviously more, more room to grow, but we have a lot of work to do to make sure folks on the other side of the district, you know, our friends in Berrien and Cass and, and Van Buren, they in Allegan know who I am too. And so um, a couple of things. First, we don't get to knock doors at the moment. You know, maybe we'll get to do some lit drop soon. We'll see. Obviously, health and safety are the number one priority, but uh, that means we need help calling folks, we need help texting folks, and people can do that from anywhere. So if you can join us for this call, you can help with that too. Uh, second though, is that we need to make sure that the message that progressives can win in 50-50 districts is, uh, is heard loud and clear. And right now, you know, I'm so pleased to see groups um, making investments, whether it's uh, like the DCCC of time or or you know, helping us with some research. But what they look at is how many calls, texts, how much money are we raising? And we want everybody across the country to see what's happening here. That in a place like Michigan's sixth district where people are hungry for change, they don't want just the usual answers or the say the right things. They wanna see someone as a progressive who is going to fight for our issues. 
who's going to say, look, there are things that we could do if we just stop giving away our taxpayer dollars to the most profitable corporations and invest in green jobs that are actually going to make our water cleaner, our, our skies easier to breathe, our areas to breathe, and we can even lay some rural broadband while we're at it, which is a big deal in my issue. And so I need help. I need your help with uh, connecting with voters, and I absolutely need your help um, with raising money so this race pops on the national scene. Thank you so much, Norbert, for the question and, and John for the, uh, for the answer. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, keep them rolling in. We have some great questions for, for folks. Next question is from our friend uh, Robert Frame. Uh, Robert, what's your question for John? Hi there. Say, so I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to intro it a little bit, just a tiny bit for everyone on the call. But I'm going to start by saying, I'm sorry about your husband's diagnosis and what he's saying that you are having to go through. And I couldn't help but think right away, but you were sitting there together and acknowledged together and spoken to as a couple about what was going on. And that's such a sea change from not all that long ago. And from certain states, it's still not required. Many states, it's still not required. So despite the recent Supreme Court decision, which you know Gorsuch surprised us all, and Roberts didn't surprise us a bit, and despite the uh, the fact that many states have protections for queer people and their and their relationships, a majority, I think a majority, do not still, and this this only is partially fixed by the Supreme Court decision. So, with that said, how optimistic are you that the, the Congress that meets in January is going to be able to pass the Equality Act, which would provide that? protection for every across the country but then also what, what do you think would have to happen to get it through the senate so um, that's, a, that's i it. love that question and can i and, and by the way robert thank you for saying that um i really do appreciate you acknowledging that um and um you know and shout out by the way anyone who has run for office knows that your spouse your partners are so important in this um you know there's a lot of times where i'm stuck at work or, or talking to folks and uh, he's at home and uh, I appreciate that he, he puts up with it. So uh, he's a saint, but let's see. Okay, so to your question, um, I'm feeling if we elect me to Congress, that will be flip one more no vote to a yes vote. And that makes me much more confident that we will be able to continue to pass the Equality Act. Let's not, for, in the Congress, let's not forget that we needed a democratic majority and, and ideally a pro-equality majority within that to actually move that legislation. And once we did, more folks came on board. We see that all the time where uh, folks aren't, um, where a lot of times folks aren't uh, being responsive um, in, in terms of like the really realizing the legislative barriers that exist to moving good legislation. But secondly, um, I would say that, uh, you know, we have an opportunity here um, where investment in the sixth congressional district helps us uh, also move towards that goal of building majority in the Senate and making sure that uh, Joe Biden is in the White House. You know, my part of the district is a place where a lot of times Democrats haven't spent time or energy. And when we do the work in the sixth congressional district and find more voters to, to come out and support our work, then what we end up seeing is more support for um, Democrats up the ticket and down the ticket. Hey, one, here's another cool thing. Michigan right now is only four seats away from a Democratic legislative majority. Three of the top 10 seats are in my district. And while the White House, uh, race for the White House and you know, statewide races like the US Senate race drive large parts of the message, it's congressional races that turn voters out. And so we are working closely with folks up and down the ticket to make sure that we are delivering key votes that could then set us up for success in a Senate and electing a president that would sign the Equality Act into law. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Our next question, I think we have time for just a few more that we're going to uh, push in here. So uh, we have our friend Rahik uh, Mazumder. Rahik, what's your question for John? Yeah. Um, how do you feel about investing in nuclear energy, such as thorium or nuclear fusion, to combat climate change? Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm. Uh, one thing I learned a long time ago is uh, if you're not an expert on something, you know, say that up front. So for me, I'm looking at stuff like when we look at a, a environmental solutions, obviously my priority is gonna be on 100% clean and renewable energy solutions. And so that's what I wanna focus on. 
Um, that said, I know that there's been lots of conversations on nuclear. I'm really open to learning more. We have a couple of nuclear plants in our, in, in our district. But all that being said, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that we are looking at these truly sustainable long-term solutions. So, you know, let's double down on solar. Let's double down on wind power, things that um, really put us in a better space moving forward. But, um, you know, like I said, uh, these are things that I need to learn more about. And so I'm happy to, to do the research and welcome an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. Okay, I think folks, you have time for one more question. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna stick in here. Uh, our question's from Beth uh, Angel. Beth, what is your question for John? Hey, John. Um, I'm a fellow Michigander. I'm from Detroit, although I don't live there anymore. My question to you is, do you support the Medicare for All Act of 2019 that Representative Jayapal has um, submitted in this, past, in this Congress? Uh, so the answer to that is yes. You can see it on my website. We've talked about supporting Medicare for All. Um, and you know, the thing I keep saying about that is, um, I love to see that the conversation continues to evolve, right? And so we keep refining and adding pieces to the conversation to make it more responsive. I mean, when it comes to healthcare, I'm a big believer in an all of the above, above approach. So I know uh, that we could absolutely have a, a single payer system that covers every single American and treats healthcare as a right. I also know that there are things that we could do today to make sure that uh, things are, um, that we can address some of these issues right now. So, uh, you know, as being a legislator, um, I'm excited. I, I yes, uh, you know, I know the bill. We're supportive, and we put that on the website. And I'm also really open to say, what else should be in there, right? What what can make the bill work even better? And I think that's really important as we continue to move folks in this conversation towards that system uh, and towards a bill that really treats healthcare as a human right. Great, thank you. Thank you to everyone. I know John has to go in just a few minutes. Hopefully you saw on this call why he's going to be such a good addition to Congress and why he has such a great chance to beat Fred Upton. Um, we're very excited about this race. Please do chip in if you have a chance. And John, I have one last question for you. How will the money you are raising right now help beat Fred Upton? And are there any other final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, yeah, your funds right now are critical because they leverage in additional support from across the country. There's so many folks who are on the cusp of taking a chance on a race like mine. And so we can help move them into saying yes if you take a chance on me right now. When your investment, your support lets us continue to build a bigger team and reach folks who oftentimes are not included in these types of conversations. And we're going to have to find a lot of different ways to reach them this year, online, on the phones, on text, and the mail, a whole bunch of different ways. And so I need your help. And I'm not shy about asking for that because um, I wouldn't be spending this much time and energy fighting for people in communities if I knew that it wasn't going to be worth it, that things would be better if we change the direction of who's sitting in this seat. So I'm asking for your help. Um, and you know, I just sincerely appreciate all the, the time, the energy that you've taken in support of this race. I can't wait to get to the finish line with you. Thank you so, so much, John. Thank you, Stephanie. But most importantly, thank you to all of our friends um, that have been, uh, took the time to be here with us tonight. So with that, uh, we will uh, say thank you to John. Um, please keep an eye, um, eyes open for an invite for our next Meet the Candidates call in the series next week. Thank you all so much for being engaged. Stay healthy, stay well, um, stay positive, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.